Um, I'm honored to be the first lecturer here, and uh, yes, I um, let me share the slides and uh, then um, start also a introduction to the topic and uh, and uh, and the subject and and myself also. Yes, it is about software ecosystems and and qualitative methods in software engineering. So I'm kind of standing for both. So I start with the software ecosystems today. And um, so the, the lecture will have actually two parts and we'll have a, a short break in between also. So um, yes, who am I and, and what is the background that, that I bring to the, to, to the school? Um, I'm a, a professor in computer science um, at the IIT University of Copenhagen. I'm also an adjunct professor at the IIT Mandi Indian Institute of Technology in Mandi. Um, I have, uh, yeah, what I have been doing software engineering research since my PhD in the uh, late 80s. And I have um, what I am have been working with and, and where I'm kind of known for is the two themes in a way that is uh, use orientation in software engineering. So, my main motivation to go into is to understand how users and developers are cooperating and in order to, to develop useful software. And the other part is looking into cooperative and human aspects of software engineering, because software development is developed by people for people. So it is a not only, but it's also a social process and a social activity. Um, so, and it is cooperative work. And that is these two, two sides of my, my research. And um, you see that there are other themes here and um, also publications on this, on this uh, part, but we'll um, mainly focus today on um, things that came out through a series of research questions. And that is in a way somehow here, uh, software development beyond the project. And in the first part of the lecture, and after that, in the second part, we look into um, the qualitative empirical research that actually addresses the social side of software development. So how does that fit with the um, other, why is it? Yeah. So this is the rough schedule for today. Um, I have difficulties at the same time concentrating on the slides in my lecture and to see um, the, the chat and the interaction. And also we are very many people here. So I will try to take breaks in between so that you can ask questions and I ask also um, maybe uh, the, the Anton as, as one of the organizers to to uh, to help me by by observing the chat and and uh, noting down the questions so that I can um, then answer them. There was one uh, one of you pointing. Um, is there anything that is that is urgent um, questions? Okay. So then, um, yes, please uh, note the chat. I think Anton will, will read the chat and, and collect the questions a bit, and then we'll have these decided places where we, where we have time for discussion also. So the first part is, is uh, software engineering beyond the project. And I think this is um, um, maybe not a bad, part to start with for a, a week on software engineering, because it is actually looking into um, what are the challenges um, that we, we are facing when we are talking about using formal methods, understanding, testing, uh, applying um, artificial intelligence on, on, on uh, repository data, things like that. So. Um, 
And so the topic here is a bit about looking into um, how is software, software actually developed? What is this? Okay, sorry. So you are, most of you are master or bachelor students. Um, so for sure, most of you are familiar with the notion of a project, right? So software engineering is said to take place in form of projects. So then what is a project? And in order to look into that, um, you could actually start to, to look at your teaching books or look at definitions. What I did uh, is I looked into uh, definitions of a project in, um, there is a, a website that I cite here on that slide as well, where you can actually look into all kinds of software engineering concepts and how they are defined. So there's a common um, part, you see there's, uh, they found five definition. And uh, a project is, the first definition is the most comprehensive and it's from the uh, ISO uh, 15288. And it's the endeavor to the de with defined start and finish dates undertaken to create a product or service in accordance with a specific specified with specified resources and requirements. So it has a, a defined start and a defined end. So a project um, has a predefined goal or outcome. It has a beginning and the end, and it has limited resources and consists of a number of tasks and activities. And normally when a project is over, the rest of the software engineering or the rest in quotation marks of the software engineering that goes into uh, is called maintenance. So, and part of it is also that I, based on my research, and based on, on, on what I saw in, in, in collaboration with industry, I would challenge um, that maybe we shouldn't only look at the project as the frame of reference for our software engineering methods and, and tools. So what I will do now here in the remaining of the first part of this lecture is I will start with, uh, give you an, an idea when I, where did I actually start to doubt whether project is the, the, the right frame of reference. And then we take a closer look, look at the development of software products and then go back and saying like, okay, what does that then mean for software engineering and for our methods? So in a way, somehow the whole thing here became, began with a scientific argument. I was in the project together with people working with participatory design and, um, and we started to say like, and it was about e-government. So that means introducing of, of IT in, in the provision of governmental services um, in Sweden that was still, and that was all about this uh, people using the software and the problems with the software. But I said, well, kind of, kind of where are the designers who is actually working with that? And, then the, the head of the one-stop shop in service board, uh, you, could call her a super user. She said, well, the designers, that's us. And we started to challenge actually who's designing, what, when, for whom, and with the shifting foci of design here. So of course, some people had the software into focus, but a lot of people had the services that they provided for the citizens into in focus. So the, prob the, the software then was only one part of that, but what are the processes? Who is, has the expertise and things like that? And do the people with the right expertise have the right tools? Um, so, and when we also said, when you look at software engineering from a use organization point of view, you see that there is often no clear cut between projects, but you have a diversity of interlaced practices. And there's so, okay, we are changing the software here. We have these people developing this custom solution for us here. Then we buy a telephone exchange that should work with our calendar system and the booking system for our uh, sports places. So you got suddenly a, a set of really um, places where design decisions are taken that influence the software and are influenced by software. Um, yeah. 
And we saw that there was a huge requirement for flexibility in the process and also the flexibility of the software engineering side. And as that was before 2000, before the AGI manifesto, that also kind of was putting a question mark on the waterfall model. And that is then also um, the point here, somehow when we started to look at the best software provider, that was a five person company selling an off the shelf booking system, the first software product we looked into then. And um, they were sitting in, in kind of a very, very small place. You would call it a village in, in, in the, in the Danish, even in the Danish uh, side, uh, kind of where we have smaller towns and 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 smaller villages, in the in kind of in southern Sweden, in um, and um, of these five people, there were only two developers. And what they do is they get they use the support from their customers to to get the feedback and improvement ideas. And the customers were all over Scandinavia. Finland, Denmark, Sweden. So there were 300, 400 uh, municipalities and sports places, arenas that used their software. Um, they had user meetings to get feedback, to get an understanding what is the next features they needed to develop. They recruited pilot users for major developments. And what was especially interesting here is they had about 20 releases per year to, for fixing errors and small improvements, sometimes bigger improvements. So major releases would be you had the, the change in the database scheme. So you had to, to have some transitioning there. And, um, and minor releases where you actually just had, uh, yeah, you didn't need to, to, to move the database. So again, um, there was no project. There was no nothing that there was not as the, these two, mainly two, three developers, they were kind of deciding at the at the lunch table what to develop at the afternoon. So, um, so we started to say, and yeah, so that was the first ever thing that we met a software product. But then when you start to be aware of this, you start to see more and more of them. So I put a number of um, software uh, products that we, some of you might know, uh, most of you might know game, game en engines. Well, maybe not game engines, but computer games. But computer games are used by, um, I, I've developed using game engines and game engines are kind of like the, the underpinning uh, uh, product. So you could actually say that a computer game is a customization uh, of, a, of a game engine. But you have also booking systems we talked about, um, enterprise resource planning systems, uh, billing gateway. Billing gateway is in telecommunication. It's collecting all the, the call data records that come in and uh, distributes it to the back end to fraud detection and to billing and things like that. That is a standard system. Um, system administration tools, Eclipse, you will know. And all of these are products that are actually not really finished. Um, they are continuously developed over. So you wouldn't call uh, a new feature in Eclipse, you wouldn't call maintenance work. It is a new feature, it's a new development. So we define software products as programs that are developed to be used by more than one user and or customer often need to be configured and customized to a specific use context. So they are half products, they are not finished necessarily. Um, when they, as a, they are not, not all of them are shrink wrapped. So they can actually, most of them actually allow for uh, customization and tailoring. Um, and they're used over an extended span of time and are continuously updated to match evolving net needs. So we are focusing here in the research that I, uh, the research that I present uh, forward is, is based on four cases that um, I um, researched together with PhD students. So the research, the, the, the basic, as a, you could say, the, uh, if you read the article, you will see that 
I refer to that research as a triangulating research that has been done before, but as all of this research had a different topic, um, had, didn't have the topic of software ecosystems. What I did is uh, when I saw a pattern emerge over this interaction with these different companies, that I went back and did interview uh, core people in these companies in order to, um, to help me to understand the phenomenon of software uh, products better. So, and in the motivating uh, or this, this kind of first discussion about the first example that I met, I, um, there somehow we had this figure where we said, okay, there's, there's uh, these developers, local designers, service providers, and citizens, and they all together are kind of cooperating around what does it mean to provide IT-based governmental services. Um, when you then look into the software product, products, and here I use uh, the Microsoft um, Dynamics um, um, NAV, um, NAV, it's now kind of called a business center, but it was uh, then at that point it was called NAV. Um, so here somehow you have suddenly, uh, you have a similar set of different kind of developers involved in developing the software product before or until it gets uh, to be used at the customers. So here we have customers in the context of an enterprise resource planning system are normally companies. So enterprise resource planning system are helping you to administrate the production and the, the, the people involved and um, so here at the, at the customers, you have so-called super users or administrators. For example, when, they're, when you hire a new, um, a new person for human resource, then you would not, who should work with the system, then you would not reprogram the system, but you would actually add that person and give him or her the, the right uh, access rights to, to access the, the, the parts of the system that he or she should work with. And that is done often by some people, they, they also call it, we call them local designers. It's, it's in a way, these people here. Um, and they often do also smaller configurations um, beyond just adding new, what they call metadata. Um, and they are cooperating with implementation partners, all ERP systems that we encounter, also SAP, for example, is, is another one, or um, Dynamics uh, AX um, is another one. And all of them are working with a model where they have small companies that translate the needs of the customer and configure and customize the system. And when I talk about configuration, I talk about configuration through a configuration interface. Uh, when I talk about customization, I'm talking about changing the source code of the system based on the respective development environment and programming language. So the, um, these people here are then kind of cooperating um, or yeah, using the software that is developed by the software provider. And in the case of the ERP systems, they distinctly uh, talked about two groups of people here. Most of the ERP system come with an own um, uh, runtime system and an own programming language, a proprietary database. So we, the people developing this uh, infrastructure or this, this programming language um, level for the uh, ERP system, they are one type of developers. They were always called framework developers, whereas the people using this system, they were the application developers and they were often um, had a, a one leg into uh, the business side of, of, uh, so of the usage of the software. So here again, you had this two distinct group of people. Some of them were, um, more technical minded and, and focusing on the base system. 
And when we, during the interview, it became also visible that um, these people here in, in the case that uh, in, during the interview time, um, the dynamics nav, uh, it had been bought, bought a few years earlier by Microsoft. So they now changed from a proprietary tech stack to the Microsoft tech stack. And that meant that they had to talk to some of the Microsoft units in order to um, negotiate their requirements, for example, to the Microsoft databases. So with other words, uh, again, we had this, this, or like on the usage side, we have here on the development side, where we don't have just one group of people that is developing one product. No, uh, what hits the user here is actually co-designed by a number of different stakeholders distributed over different organizations. So the box that I have here is the organizations and the arrows mean collaboration with. Um, so the research methods, we are talking about research methods later. Uh, in this case, as I already told that it was based on existing research. So we had, uh, we used qualitative interviews of one to three interviews per company and had done used an um, analysis method that is called based on a bottom-up identification of, of themes, it's called coding. So we first to openly see kind of what are we talking about here? Uh, what are the interviews talking about? And then as a second point, you start to identify recurring themes and then you use these recurring themes to analyze the, the, the interviews in the second round. And that of course was based, uh, based on and, and, and supported by triangulated with previous ethnographical fieldwork and long-term contact. So I think that I wouldn't have been able to ask these questions that I ask in the interviews without this long-term contact. So I, um, yes. So one of the things we started to use this notation to, to talk about and to, and to describe the different um, ecosystems where, that we started to, to talk about ecosystems in this context. So we had, um, and the other cases that I might refer to here is uh, besides the Dynamics Nav, we have this um, UIQ, they developed a UI framework for high-end mobile phones. And uh, you could say that this case also justifies why it is called an ecosystem. Um, UIQ was um, actually working, um, doing software, um, related to the Symbian um, operating system for mobile phones. And when Nokia then made the Symbian operating system that was before the Android um, or kind of parallel to the Android coming, coming about, made that open source and it more or less killed the whole, uh, both the Symbian uh, development, but also uh, the interface development and the whole collaboration between Symbian, UIQ, um, the customers and owners of the two company, these two companies, and then uh, third party application developers. And here the user interface part was uh, on one hand, of course, very tightly connected to the Symbian operating system because it needed operating uh, system features and, and functionality to implement that. It was then collaborating tightly with the customers, which was, uh, which was Siemens, uh, um, Nokia, and Motorola uh, that were using both software and further developing that to brand it for their specific mobile phones. And then also um, third party um, developers of specific applications. We have here, um, a totally different system, some uh, uh, hydraulic simulation software for a company working with um, modeling uh, rivers and 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 lakes and seas. And um, again, we had um, we had the the core uh, the basic was developed by 
um, a, a group of people that were specialists in, in, in uh, solving, um, um, solving differential equations. And um, here people using that software to then simulate, uh, develop specific simulations, modeling specific rivers. Um, and at the time where we did the interviews, they started to also work with customers that were themselves using the software to manage rivers and water, bodies of water and, and sewer systems also. Um, the last part is a uh, distribution, the software, open source software, distributing software in a local area network. And that is a case for an open source software system and uh, here we have uh, the company, um, they do this open source, they develop the software for the customers and with the customers, the customers are writing installation scripts that they share with each other in the, in the community. Um, and um, the software itself is, um, is providing the basic functionality to run scripts on a client server. Um, on a client computer um, from collaborating with a server and installing software on the client computer. And as that is a very operating system closed task, um, they are depending on a uh, Linux kernel and a Linux kernel update would require up for them updating their software. And the same is for each of the when there's a new operating system, they have to update uh, their software as well. So the operating system, targeting operating system. So if they want to install for Microsoft or for Mac OS, they need to make sure that their software runs with these operating systems. So when we started the an analysis here, so we have these very, very different kinds of software. So what are the commonalities with that? And in order to structure the results, I'm using a um, a figure that, that is based on, on my PhD supervisor's uh, concept of, of um, uh, software engineering as uh, design uh, or design perspective on software engineering, saying that we are actually, when we do software engineering, we connect, um, we relate to, to the product, of course, and the usage, the functionality, the, program, uh, the, the pro product program should, should support, but then we also relate and design our own development processes. So I'm, I'm using this triangle there. So when we look at the product side of software products, also the technical side of software products, um, you can see that because you want to be able to adapt the software to different contexts, you need, um, you are deferring a lot of the design to as late as possible. So you, the technology, the technical design needs to both support evolution of the basic software, but then also the, 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 the customization and the configuration to the different use contexts. Um, and this is done of partly, as a, this is done in different ways, uh, especially how can you actually um, further uh, um, use the software that uh, the, the product that is developed. Um, there can be um, like domain specific programming language, like in the context of ERP systems, or what kind of define having installation scripts, uh, language to define in, in installation scripts is also a programming language. Um, but it can also be uh, uh, just a, a predefined set of of configuration decisions or using metadata like uh, in ERP systems. So these, um, the, the, this, the interface between these different ways of developing software, this is often technical interfaces, APIs, domain specific languages um, that on the one hand, this kind of provide the basis for the uh, people configuring and the people um, 
customizing the software, but on the other hand, they are also like a, a bridging between that because that is the point where then the negotiation about and the redesign takes place. So, oh, we, we need to have this other functionality. Can you provide us with a new feature here in order for us to, to use, uh, uh, to continue to use the database, uh, uh, things like that. And um, these interfaces need to make, be maintained. Um, for example, here in UIQ and Symbion, uh, we saw actually people, uh, the, 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 our interview is reported, people um, um, reported parts of the subsets, modules of the software being shifted from UIQ to Symbion because um, it was an operating closer to the operating system and should be maintained and further developed with the operating system and the same on, on this side. So, so these interfaces are, are contested and will be negotiated and they change um, also because of the new needs uh, from the use context here. Um, so how is that maintained? And I think that is a concept that, that a PhD student started to coin and that we call that walking architecture. Most of these, um, we are talking about architecture very much as a document heavy activity. In this cases, uh, these companies didn't maintain an explicit architecture and they had a good argument for that. They said, any architecture with this dynamics of development that we are facing, any architecture is outdated very, very soon. Because it was not about finishing a product, it was about continuously evolving the product. So if then the architect would put his knowledge into a document, it would A, be outdated, B, um, he would lose the contact with the developers he would lose to understand where in this development are points where the old, the current architecture is not supporting anymore uh, the development. And we come back to that later because changes in the architecture was also a regular thing that was taking place and it was um, part of the evolution here also. So if we then look into the processes, um, yeah, so and that that actually led to that, um, yeah, the phenomenon was in, in all of these cases, we had a, a group of, of highly skilled um, software tech leads, software architects, who were more or less taking the role of communicating the architecture, supporting developers, um, implementing changes in an uh, in compliance with the architecture and at the same time gathering knowledge about how the architecture needs to be developed in the future. So if you look at that now kind of from the process side, um, by now it should be clear that there's no kind of like beginning and end. Uh, we, are, we are talking about software evolution and, and very much in line with a very agile processes. Um, when we looked into, into the, the evolution and the, the drivers for the evolution, there was non, not, no one cycle, no one process. There were actually an overlay of three different evolutionary cycles, at least three different evolutionary cycles with different rhythms. Um, and that was the, 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 the there was back fixing of course, then there was new features, which sometimes also was a release or kind of was released regularly. Uh, sometimes it was new features that as in the open source, the new features were av available as soon as the, 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 uh, they were tested and, and, and finished. Um, but then there was also, and, and that was an, an interesting to see, it was again in, in all of, the, in, in all of the four cases, you had revisions um, of the architecture because the architecture is designed for a specific set of functionality. And when the functionality, uh, uh, the new change requests, when they are, uh, they are unanticipated changes, so they are not planned for in the architecture. That means 
after a while, the architecture is getting um, kind of challenged by the, the evolution. So you have to ha revamp or revise the architecture now and then to, to accommodate the, the, the new features. So in this, uh, this, this, this kind of architectural refactoring cycles, they were, as a, I think in a way, similar you, all of these, uh, the, the rhythms were different because the software, the kind of software was different. The drivers for change were more intense or less intense. The size was different too. Um, but we had the, the situation was like when the bug fix cycle was a day or two, um, then the, the new feature cycle was uh, maybe um, uh, several weeks or a month. And then the, the, the refactoring cycle was um, maybe several years. Um, so, what we have here is is um, and when the yeah when the bug fix cycle was several months, then the release cycle was several uh, two three years, and then the the architecture refactoring had several releases. So you you didn't here when we interviewed the the Microsoft NAV uh, people, uh, they were on the way to replace the, the the tech stack with the Microsoft stack, and that of course was a major change. So you wouldn't do that through one release. So they split the, 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 the moving, the replacement of the, of the stack over several releases. Um, so, and how to organize this process is, is contested. So it's not clear whether, for example, feature teams are the right organization or, um, or the, the separation of groups of uh, framework versus application development and things like that. So the different companies experimented with actually different organization ways of organizing. So Microsoft, they had a very decided way. They said, okay, if it's a feature heavy release, then we have feature teams. And if it is a um, more a release that is, is focusing on the framework and, and tech, uh, technical uh, change in technical uh, solutions in the tech stack, then it is, we have competence related teams. And sometimes they had in the beginning of the of the release, they had their teams organized in competence uh, groups. Towards the end, they they uh, they moved to feature groups. So, um, what is also was clear somehow, if you have this kind of complex software development process, it's really important to get input from what happens in the other development constituent design constituencies. Also what happens in the use context? What are the new things that the partners see? Um, what is happening? What are the plans here in the, in the, on, the, on, the, on the Microsoft side or in this uh, operating system? What happens in the Linux kernel? And how does that change and how do, can we relate to it? How can we relate to it? And here somehow you see kind of um, the company is a small company. They don't have any impact on what happens in the Linux kernel. So it's a one-sided collaboration, you could say. So keeping track of what happens in other design constituencies is, is really considered as, as a core importance. And um, sometimes they, some of the development was then called a project and that was in order to, to create a temporary closure so that there was like uh, kind of to, to make sure for a certain amount of time that the changes to the software were controlled so that some new development could take place and uh, then it was merged again into the, the normal evolution rhythm. And that was, for example, here we saw that uh, when they changed their core uh, data structure for, um, they, um, they did that independent on the day-to-day -day evolution of the software. And then when, when the, the new architecture was in place and the new data structures were in place, then actually they moved um, 
they moved uh, the the uh, they merged that with the the ongoing development. When it comes to use and uh, use context, um, um, you have these interlacing design constituencies. So you have design taking place with different rationales on, on different levels here. That means what the hits the user in the end um, is is actually not not only designed by one person or one organization, one company. It is as a things that happened far away from the user and out of control will influence what happens uh, in the when he is using the software. So the cooperation uh, for the software product um, companies, they felt themselves that they were far away from their users because often the users are, are a lot of users, um, they are distributed over different organizations. So it's not like having one organization for whom you develop a piece of software where you have a tight connection with the customers. Yet it's also difficult to have customer representatives here. So a lot of these companies work with a product um, managers that are coordinating the, the often have their own pilot users, their pilot companies with whom they actually discuss new features. Um, so cooperation with users is not a given, but maybe therefore considered important. And if you talk about product managers in, in product companies, then these are the people that are relate uh, import uh, that are responsible for this collaboration. And in some cases, trade-off between features for users and technical quality is is um, is discussed and is observed and. Sometimes uh, the, the change in the architecture is postponed until um, in order to uh, prioritize uh, important new features to, to stay in the market and to keep the software useful. So, okay. So now kind of where is the project? As a, what we saw here, there is no single project but an interlace of development activities. The requirements cannot be regarded as fixed, but are subject to, to multi-level feedback. And there's no process, but continuously development of several rhythms overlaying each other, no one process. Software is not necessarily developed uh, before it is used. It's sometimes used before it is further developed. So you can actually have a possibility to learn from your users about usability, usefulness, and, and new features. And that means the new solutions have to, but on the other hand, this means also that new solutions have to take social and technical heritage into account. Um, and that means that you are not free to just change, for example, your configuration system totally, because then you put uh, a lot of, you make a lot of work, um, uh, can, as you delete a lot of work by the users or by the partners, and that means also that the people don't update, upgrade the software to the new version. Architectural knowledge management needs to support this continuous evolution, and in a way, somehow you could say there's no blank slate ever. So, um, and Lucy Sachman said, well, kind of, we have to, to we are technical disciplines talk about like design from nowhere. Like if you are out of, of uh, like you, you just have the requirements and then you have the users and the needs and then you have a design. Um, but actually we are always designing software in a context with a given technical base and with um, given social arrangements. So we should actually start to understand uh, design as artful in integration. And I think that is becoming also very, very uh, prominent or visible in, in this research. So in the conclusions here, and um, and that is also where it can, how that affects um, methods and tools in a way somehow, if you think about this, um, academic tools and languages are proofs of, cons uh, yeah, 
proofs of, of, of concept often, but they need to develop to fit the reality of software product ecosystems. So if you think about, for example, formal verification and, and, and um, how can we make these methods fit with a continuous evolution? So can we do have something that is uh, some, some software is 50% is uh, verified? Um, a lot of the testing strategies are already going into that direction and this kind of um, um, continuous testing um, and where each of the, the increments that, that are developed as, as tested is, 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 is a relevant part of it. But can we actually make verification so flexible? Um, we need to understand, as a, there's a, better, a need for a better understanding of the requirements for, for tools and languages. Another part is, for example, these configuration languages. Uh, they are smart languages and, and uh, domain specific languages uh, allowing programming for, for, not, as for non, not so technical people. But we actually don't have any design principles for that. Um, many of the, the software methods and tools are based on the notion of the project. Um, this might need to be reconsidered. Um, we need to cope with interlays of heterogeneous development and, and use activities. And how can we uh, support design collaboration among, along this kind of chain of design that I showed in the, in the figures? Um, users are, are able and, and willing to, to, to actually ex so to, to configure and, and tailor their software. And uh, some people say that this is the way forward. If we want to continue to grow the software sector, we, we need to have to, to, to enroll the users in part of the development, but they need to be well supported. So I think in the, in the human computer interaction, we'll see a move from it's too easy to use to, to easy to develop. Um, and here somehow the whole area of end user development, the research area of end user development comes in. So this research has been, um, and that's my last slide for this, this, this first part of the, the lecture. Um, this research has been done, um, published in, in 2014. That means it's time ago, uh, some time ago. Um, is that still relevant? And I think actually there is a growing interest into both software ecosystems and, and data ecosystems. People start to talk about data ecosystems. And I, um, I will raise to your uh, awareness in a way that I think we, we can proud that uh, we um, data are uh, one of the countries where um, the whole kind of IT administration of the vaccination and the Corona pass thing with the pandemic here. Um, and that was because we had a very strong IT platform that allowed a modular, um, uh, both um, adding in additional data sources and adding, uh, adding um, additional uh, clients and, and apps on the front side. So without that strong platform, we would not have been able to, to that quickly um, develop the, the relevant apps and automate the whole registration for vaccinations. Um, I don't know actually how that worked in the other countries, but I know that uh, there was much more chaos and there still is much more chaos in the, in the German uh, system because um, the, the, the tradition of, of uh, heterogeneous platforms, um, depending on the different uh, substate. Um, so I, uh, so in our um, whole kind of, in the um, healthcare, you see the need of um, not developing each application from scratch and 
there's colleagues of mine from the Aarhus University have they have this uh, had this this uh, project on analysis and design of software ecosystem architectures for telemedicine and and like replacing as a making separating out the uh, development of the the um, uh, technical infrastructure provisioning from the the app development uh, for telemedicine another example here and uh, i've seen some indian names and 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 uh, in the in the chat um, so in india one of the the things that is really exciting there is um, that uh, the indian government has uh, developed a set of apis that allows um, uh, supports uh, uh, the development of for example financial financial services in on a very very different way so you have uh, the possibility of, of um, uh, providing as a proving your identity uh, through biometrics, um, the possibility to pay uh, through uh, electronically, um, to store um, documents and data um, through a document storage, and then also to provide consent. Um, electronically and with that they provide a platform for then um, the provisioning of, of mobile um, services financial services or or um, uh, retail services and to and that is in the moment uh, about to 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 change um, I think change India's economy so and what you have here is, is again, you have uh, different layers of uh, different kind of connected um, development activities that are dependent on each other through the usage of uh, as a, and, and interacting with each other through uh, the usage and the, the design of, of APIs. So, Yes, now I have talked for one hour or so. Um, I'm sure many of you have some questions. Um, Anton, did you did you see um, in the chat, uh, have there been posted some questions? Let me have a look. I don't think there were any questions yet. Uh, if anyone has questions, please ask them now. Um, so I think uh, you can ask them in the chat and I will read them out loud. Okay, so there is, there is, um, um, there was in a way somehow there's our testers part of the software ecosystem. Uh, yes. Um, yes, uh, that is a direct was a direct message here. Um, yes, testers are part of the ecosystem um, in all levels. Um, so, so you have testers in the, the, the product development, as a, the basic product development, and you have testers. So when I talk about software development, uh, I mean software development and testers and requirement specific uh, people and human computer interaction people. How many testers you have depends, of course, on how big your software development is. And often uh, nowadays, uh, the, when we talk about um, small teams in like in continuous software engineering or HR development, the testers are are the software engineers are testers as well, and, and testers are part of the team. Um, the the slides are, I sent the slides to the organizers and you're, you're welcome to, to share them. Um, there, I normally provide the, the, the references in on the slides. So here you have this big uh, list of references of the, of the research that I built on uh, earlier than here. So now you have the, the reference of the, um, wait, this is,
I'm, I'm now kind of messed up my screen, sorry. Yeah, yeah, back here. Um, this is the, the reference for the, um, for the article where these, these, um, these thoughts are further developed. And, um, and I will provide also, so there will be a list of references for the second uh, part of the lecture as well. And um, yeah, you, Anton, what is the plan for, um, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, distributing the slides? Uh, I think we can post them in our Telegram chat so that any participant can download them if that's okay with you. Yeah, I think that's, that's fine. Um, uh, yeah, that's fine. Then the, um, and there was a question about how do you think about machine learning? Um, I think uh, machine learning is different from, from traditional software engineering systems. I'm not sure about the architectures, but I think that there will be, a, there's a change in, um, in how software is developed for machine learning, because in the way somehow you, you cannot, you don't, you cannot plan for what you find. Uh, when, you, when you talk about uh, these, these machine learning systems, the, the way to develop them is often more exploratory. And then you have, uh, um, then you have a, a um, um, so you have to allow for this exploration as part of the software engineering process. Um, I haven't looked into to architectures for for e-learning as a, a machine learning systems, but yeah. Um, temporary closure. Um, what does it mean with it? Uh, closure means you are kind of kind of enclosing something. And the temporary closure means, okay, we are, for a certain time, we don't take in new requirements or we have, um, and we, we, we kind of fix the context in or, and then we are kind of developing something in something that could be called a project. And then we move into these kind of design cycles again. So that means, um, I saw that in, in several cases that uh, either it was a group of people were um, focusing for some time on, for example, in the case of the, the operating system tool, um, the, the development of the new, um, uh, the new data structures. And uh, so they weren't in as a, well, while they were doing that, and while they were doing testing this new data structure, they um, didn't merge the code with the uh, ongoing uh, development code. And only afterwards they in, uh, included that. And that was a conscious decision by the development team to, um, to, to keep this uh, architectural change as uh, kind of protect that from the continuous, from the dynamics of the continuous evolution. Um, and that, but that is only for some time and it should be as short time as possible because otherwise you have, when you merge, you have to uh, adjust too much of the uh, evolution that has been going on uh, parallel to the, to the uh, kind of this closed, enclosed uh, part of the development. Um, so um, I'm taking two more questions and then I think we, we should also, there is a discussion session and um, for you to, to discuss further. And um, but there was, there's a question here, what about over configurability uh, or over engineering? Um, is there, there's some golden ratio between making all hard and soft, um, Um, I think this is, uh, um, we had actually, yeah, so that is, that is, um, 
in this project that we had with the uh, ERP uh, system provider and the it was to, uh, together with this uh, hydraulic uh, simulation software, um, there was a discussion. I was was there uh, working together with Peter Sistoff to us into programming languages and the same. Yeah, we have the tools. We know how to do this uh, better. Why open? Why open up to the to the uh, to let that uh, people use the pre programming language level? Why not having um, configurations? And I think that when it comes to these enterprise resource planning systems. Um, the aim is to cover a lot and then um, a lot of variation in terms of what kind of uh, companies are we talking about, what is their needs and things like that. So part of the configuration you can anticipate and then you can provide specific uh, interfaces for that. But part of this need for configuration flexibility you cannot anticipate. So the the uh, and so there are good reasons for 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 opening up and for um, providing this this flexibility, but of course, and that is that is where you can actually constrain what the user can do and the, the configuration that um, needs to be done. That is. Um, then we have the tools for it. We have uh, domain specific languages. We have uh, APIs. We have uh, more specific configuration interfaces. And yes, um, but it is not always possible. And we don't have a um, just as we have good examples for these kind of interfaces, configuration interfaces, and and uh, but we don't have uh, or domain specific languages that are understandable to to non IT professionals, but we don't have a systematic knowledge about what are the options and um, how do you choose uh, which option works for which kind of users, which kind of context. So um, there has been research on that in the project as well. And if you um, look for uh, software product ecosystems and Peter Sestoft, you will find um, or software products and Peter Sestoft, you will find uh, an article there. And I'm not sure whether it's on the list in the slides. Does that answer your uh, answer your um, question? Um, then I take the Mohammed's also um, Um, yes, how to monitor in the continuous evolution of software engineering systems. I think in a, in a way, if you if you are a small group, um, as a day, the, the first product company we met, that was these five people, they did control the evolution at their lunch table. Um, in, so when you look at Microsoft, you have um, you have the product management as a very, very important um, uh, function in that. So the product managers are, they are involved in, uh, for example, the, the, the uh, kind of uh, continuously ongoing development, the triage of, of errors uh, and back reports. They are involved in, um, user studies and work with that. And so they are they are the ones who um, make as a, who also together as groups discuss the um, the strategic uh, future of a software product and then they communicate that back to or kind of uh, back to the, the software engineers they develop with. So these structures are also uh, different for different um, for different uh, sizes of, of uh, uh, development. But uh, if you're interested in that, then look into the product management uh, literature on um, and, and research. Um, what means the eco in the ecosystem? The eco means that, uh, that you have um, 
ecosystem means that, um, and that is what, what I said with this, the, the UIQ example, um, you have different uh, units here that are dependent on each other. Um, and they are sometimes also kind of have conflicting interests. So, um, so the, the uh, but um, nonetheless, they have to cooperate in order to survive in, in the world. So for example, when uh, UIQ, when um, one of the owners, um, Nokia bought out all the other owners um, and then decided to make the Symbian operating system an open source uh, system, op open source software. It changed the whole kind of way of com cooperating, communicating between the parties involved. Um, and it more or less killed both the Symbian operating system and all the kind of development based on it. So, um, so this, um, so the cooperation between different actors in this, uh, in such an ecosystem um, and uh, both around the software and through the APIs, you could think about the software also as a, as a communication uh, there, um, is, um, is kind of, uh, uh, as if you shake it too much and if you take out some of these stakeholders, you will, um, you will can have the whole system collapsing and that is uh, justifying to call it an ecosystem. Um, okay, now um, it's high time. Uh, I think we, we might need to, to shorten the discussion a bit, but um, so we are, uh, we are already um, after so we have kind of um, more or less we are in the midst of the small group discussions. So I think I propose that we uh, have a short discussion in small groups, maybe 10 minutes um, and then, or, or maybe 10, 15 minutes and then come here and then one or two of the groups will present and then we, um, and then we uh, go further. And um, for the small group discussion, this is the task. Um, I will, Anton will split you up in randomly in uh, groups of five participants and um, for discussion and please take notes in, in these discussions. And uh, the questions are where, where did you in your research and studies come upon software ecosystems? Uh, what are, interesting questions that you have, and some of them we discussed already, and how would you go about to research them? Um, and so, uh, and if you come around one or two questions in the discussion in these 10 minutes, um, then I think I'm, I'm happy. Um, and then I will ask uh, two or three groups to, to share their, their discussion results. Okay. Um, so sh sh should I uh, divide uh, the participants now? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so it is done. Uh, now everyone can enter their groups and start discussing.
So I keep that here somehow that uh, so that um, the uh, as, a, as, as I, I keep sharing the the screen so that um, the uh, um, the students can can actually uh, see the the questions. Good. Yes. Thank you very much, Anton, for for helping the the. The discussion.
So, hello again, Anton. Uh, um, yes, hello. So we should bring uh, <laughs> them back in then in, in two minutes. Uh, uh, yes, I'm. Uh, I'm ready to do that yeah, that's, when. That's, that's wonderful. When you are ready. Uh, yeah, I, I missed uh, in Italy. Uh, which city? Which university or city? Ah, Lacula. Oh, wow. Uh, nice university. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, we actually, like two years ago. Okay. Uh, there was one question in the in the and the did did new technologies and tools uh, make a difference in the conclusion you made back then? Um, I think, uh, um, I think in a way that, um, and I'm now kind of the others should slowly come back in, um, in a way, yes, uh, um, I think, uh, the, the current, uh, move towards continuous software engineering, which is like now an industry topic and a theme, I think that made visible how, um, how the how this this uh, how important the kind of change from uh, kind of a project to a uh, to a continuous development um, movement is, and a lot of the tools today are are supporting that in a different way. Um, what I observe in also when I look in continuous software engineering context and, and, and research them, I think some of the things are no still the same. So I haven't systematically looked into differences there, but um, I think we are more used to, to as we are, we are in a way, um, um, also the organization into microservices, uh, that did make a change, I think, for the architecture work. Anyway, now, um, hello everybody back. Uh, I think you you should come back, have been brought back into here now and forced back into here. So I would like to, to see, uh, to, to have two groups actually sharing the, their discussion. Um, how many groups did we have, Anton? Uh, we had 33 groups. So either you say like, yes, I would like to share what my group said, or I decide on the random group number. Um, anybody who would like to, to uh, share? Yeah, yeah. Okay, is anybody pointing? Nobody is pointing, uh, raising the hand virtually. Ah, yeah, okay. So, Muhammad, uh, please, uh, please, uh, what did you discuss in your group? In my group, uh, actually, people came and just left. But the interesting thing was that I came up with this idea and I am going to research on this that uh, software ecosystems, as you told, that it is a collection of many stakeholders as units. So I was thinking, why not the microservice, the, in, the software itself can work as ecosystems. Like in microservices, like there are different, different services acting as units. So uh, like how they evolve and how they work. Like I, I'm going to do research on this part. I think there, there is, uh... Um, there's more and more the idea also that, for ex uh, that like um, that, for example, the 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 um, the kind of um, in a way somehow the service that you use for a different uh, task, uh, you might actually uh, select a service that is just ready to hand in the sit situation, and. Um, this, but this also requires to have a common interface and to have an agreed on interface. So it means that we, again, we have to look into and there somehow um, I would recommend to look into the 
article that I had on the last slide um, by the, the 4S system, um, people in the uh, software ecosystem community uh, focus quite a bit of research on governance. And the governance means that the stakeholders, even if they are flex if the software can flexibly plug and play with each other, the you have to agree on APIs and you have to agree on um, data standards, for example. So um, that you don't only call the, the thing the same, but that the, the same thing and the same with the same data structures be, be below it also actually represents a similar concept. And I think that that is when it comes to, for example, in the context of data ecosystem, this becomes, um, it becomes visible that again, um, there's a sh shift um, in, in uh, the technical implementation. However, the, there's still the need for cooperation between actors and, um, and this dependency of the local development from the context in which uh, the software is deployed. Okay, then we mm -hmm. have Abdul Aziz wanted to share from, from his group. Uh, no, no, madam. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here in Ghana. And uh, I, I heard you talk of groups. Uh, I know nothing about it. And I wanted to ask, where which group am I? Uh, okay. where, where, where do you place me? Good. I, all right. So so I have, uh, we have, we actually discussion in the groups is over. So, so we'll have to move on now with the next, um, the next uh, lecture. Um, sorry for that. Uh, we'll kind of try to be more clear for in the in the next break with the with the groups and with the uh, how to assign. Um, maybe that is also uh, for the organizers uh, for the to to um, to maybe have a, a short uh, introduction on 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 with the if they have breakout groups how to 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 handle uh work with them um okay yes i think i would like to to continue um in order to for us to manage um the to keep the schedule and also not uh, to as the Hege, uh, Pfeiffer, who's coming uh, after me, he, is, uh, he does uh, interesting research on uh, more looking into software repositories, analyzing software repositories. And I think that I, I would like to not uh, uh, kind of uh, run late and to give him, uh, him and you also the possibility to take a break before. So the goal is to, to finish uh, 10 minutes before the next lecture starts. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll kind of, I am very happy for the questions in the chat, but I will have to continue here. So the next part is qualitative methods. And in a way, somehow, um, I talked about bottom up analysis of interviews, and that is already a qualitative method. So part of the research, um, so part of the, the, as the whole topic, I wouldn't, I, I think I would not have even gotten the idea to research it if I wouldn't have applied method in the other projects that focused on, as that, allowed me to be open to the um, how software was developed and why and I try to where I try to understand why these companies were doing this kind of uh, software development in a way that was not in the textbook so and that means um, what I'm describing now here this this openness is often connected with qualitative research so qualitative methods in software engineering, that is the topic of the second part. And um, as a motivation here, um, Margaret and Story 
had in her um, keynote lecture in the Montreal uh, ICSID in 2019, uh, presented a snapshot literature research on, uh, on from the 2017 ICSI and EMSI publications. And she published that in, a, in an article afterwards uh, in the EMSI Empirical Software Engineering Journal. And it's where she talked about the what, who, what, how, and how of software engineering research. And she used the this kind of figure to, to actually uh, frame her results. And you can think about when we, try to understand how software development actually takes place uh, when we look into the, the, um, the, 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 the practice or the kind of real world software engineering or no kind of not actually real world software engineering but we if we research software engineering we can look into uh, we can do that in an experimental way. We can, that is the lab way. So where we have um, defined experiments, uh, whether one method is better than the other method, whether one programming language is, is easier to understand than another language, um, where we have controlled experiments. Um, we can have uh, a respondent strategy where we do interviews or surveys where we try to, to get a broad picture of uh, across many different contexts in which sof software is developed. We can analyze existing data. So for example, mining software repositories to understand how software is developed, or we can look into the field. And that means we can go as a apply a field strategy. That means we can look into, observe, um, talk to software developers in their, not, not only through a survey, but in, in, in depth ways of uh, engaging with their way of software, with their, their, their specific way of developing software. And, um, Though we have a focus, there's a strong focus on empirical software engineering. Um, you see that only a very, very small part of the uh, research published in the International Conference on Software Engineering and in the Empirical Software Engineering Journal are actually applying field strategies. That means apply, go in and, and look for specific ways of how software is developed in a specific context. So with other words, um, this is, is an underrepresented uh, research strategy. On the other hand, in a way similar, sometimes I think, you know, why, why do people not look further into this way of, uh, um, into how software is developed actually in a specific context? And I, I, I think in a way, so this comic strip is, is very, um, uh, the streetlight effect is, is very much uh, responsible for that. So, um, you know, that some of you might notice this figure, this, this comic strip here. Yeah, I'm looking for a quarter I dropped. Did you drop it here? No, I dropped it two blocks down the street. Then why are you looking for it here? Yeah, because the light is better here. So, and I think that a lot of us are, are used to work with data. A lot of us are used to handle data and um, also connect to, to, to actually as a control uh, kind of are, are familiar with experiments from, from our physics classes in high school. Um, so we are feeling very safe with these kind of data and structured approaches to, to, to research. But when it comes to qualitative empirical research, and we'll talk about that later, we are very, um, we don't feel safe. We don't feel that we actually um, can, can master them. And that, that means that we might actually use methods uh, in order to answer questions that would be better answered by actually observing how software is actually developed. So, 
So with this lecture, my, my task is to, to kind of take some of your insecurity when you talk about qualitative empirical methods uh, to reduce your insecurity and to maybe give you the courage to, to engage with real world software engineering. And many of you will stand uh, just before their, their bachelor or master thesis, you might actually, um, I will focus here on qualitative methods, um, experiments, um, mining software repositories, Helge will talk about that a bit. But um, uh, if you, all of that is also valid research methods and they are important and they require care in designing the, the, the research approach. Um, but uh, please uh, refer to this book chapter in order to, um, to get an understanding how to select a research method and how to, um, and then kind of when you selected your research approach to methods and then you go and read about the specific method further. So my task here is to, to give you, to introduce you to one of the, one family of these methods. And I will start with an example and I will then look into ethnos ethnography as a specific observational method because that's also what I have been publishing about. Um, then we shortly talk about action and design research because we are an engineering discipline. So it's not only about understanding how things are, but it's also about improving how things are. And then I think a big uh, challenge for many of um, people coming from engineering and from the uh, sciences uh, is the trustworthiness of qualitative method. And I'll dedicate some part of the lecture to that. Okay, so this is a part of um, real research data. Um, and it is, uh, what is it? It's, it's a part of a chat protocol, right? And um, so when you read this through, it's kind of like, okay, Hi, DK. Also, it's in between an Indian and an and an Danish software engineering researcher, uh, software engineering uh, as a software developers. So, and then and I, I use the the country shortcut as an as an uh, pseudonym here. So, the Indian developer says hi, uh, whatever the name is. Hi, Danish developer. Uh, good morning. Um, the Danish say, hi, um, Indian developer. Uh, just a gentle reminder to review the test case for RQ244. Okay, okay thanks uh, for reminding me. And then they can go in, they discuss test cases and, and requirements. And um, so this seems to be a kind of like a, a rather like it's, it's some of you will kind of think kind of, why should I read this? I don't understand anything about the software that is developed. I don't understand what this means. However, this is actually meant to show you when you, what you, how you, as a, how you work with this kind of empirical material. So what we can see here somehow, it is starts, the, the, the chat starts at 8, 10 in the morning. Um, in Denmark, software engineers would normally start working at nine. So at eight, you send off the kids and then you go to work and then at, you're there at nine and then you work until four or five uh, or later and, and then you go home. They are starting at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and the Indian developer says, good morning. So eight o'clock in the morning in Denmark, how much is that in India? That is three and a half hours or four and a half hours difference. So this means it is lunchtime in India. Um, and however, the Indian developer waited for the Danish developer to wake up. So um, you have this kind of uh, just a gentle reminder. So, so I need to have this done because I am actually waiting for, to, for this to, to so that I can move forward, right? So, um, so we have here, um, we also have here these tracking numbers, issue tracking number. 
So that means they are referring to a common repository. So this is the chat in itself is, is kind of um, just part of a set of channels. Um, and in a way, somehow, obviously, there was a discussion before. Um, so because uh, the Dane is, is not really like, um, yeah, kind of, why are you bothering me with that? Oh, thanks for reminding me. So yes, I know kind of like I should have done that. And then um, again, um, they refer to a, a past discussion. And um, so they also see here somehow kind of the, the kind of there was here somehow we have some kind of break so the, obviously there was some review then the test case is says it's fine but notice and so in a way when you are when you're collaborating by distance you have to be very uh, specific in the way you're um as a you cannot kind of um you have to be more explicit in what you are talking about so that is but notice is avoiding the in uncertainty that can lead to misunderstandings and then in a further down and also kind of again there's a short exchange here and then there's another break and then there is this you know, kind of oh, uh, requirements are all fell nice done nice job so there's also a, a kind of a social uh, part of the talk that refers to the social so in order to, to understand how the role of, of social software in software engineering, that was what the research project was, was going about, was about, it doesn't make sense to only look at that. So what is, it's not possible just to have the traces of communication and then to understand what was actually the background. So it needed a, quite a bit of explanation now for, for me to actually help you to understand what was going on in this, in this short, short part of the chat protocol that we analyzed here. Um, that is something that call, is called in, in social science reverse indexicality. Normally, when you talk about indexicality is I am talking about he or she and referring to something else or I'm using a name. Rosanna Fiofrida, who was the PhD student uh, working with this topic. And I use that to, um, to then show and, and tell a, uh, about something outside my talk. Reverse indexicality is when something that is not present in the talk influences how we talk about things. And here somehow we that is, for example, here that we have issue trackers, that we have other channels of um, communication. So what we, uh, what we learned by observing and by being part of the development in the situation, we learned that the messenger, and at that, at that point in time, it was, was they used Skype here uh, for, as a message chair, um, that was only part of a whole kind of set of channels that was used for different purposes. And one of the important thing was that uh, the, the chat that was used was opening up both for uh, informal communication, for social uh, support and, and supportive uh, socialization, what would be termed socialization. And it allowed for raising issues uh, that then were taken up in other contexts, maybe. So, um, so we looked into and we identified collaboration, coordination, awareness, and, and socialization as the, the core issues that social software was, was able to take, but also this that it was a clue uh, between the different channels, between email and issue tracker and communicate as a face-to-face uh, -face communication in the different sites. So, um, so this is an example where it is necessary to observe the context in order to understand what the data or the, the traces, the protocol of some communication says. And the same is uh, uh, why I think it is important when you 
for example, look at the data in a repository, do a data mining approach on, on software data, that you also look into and get an understanding on what is going on in the practices in the communication that creates this data. So um, ethnography is one of the approaches that you can use in this context. So um, ethnography um, is an observational approach and um, it comes from, the name comes from Creek. Um, Ethna is a nation and craft in, it's about writing. So it's about writing or describing a culture. Um, and it takes this or it tries to understand the, Russia, as the, 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 the situation from a member's point of view. So one of the problems that uh, early researchers um, in the sociology had that they looked when they started to, to, to research um, groups of people that were rather distanced from themselves, then they were applying their own um, frame of reference on what is right or wrong or good or bad or efficient or not, not efficient on that practice. Um, that changed and uh, because people started to understand that it's more important to understand why things are the way they are and what is the function of certain actions in the specific context than to judge according to my frame of reference. So in a way, when you, the question about, um, for example, uh, that we had about um, why do you do this flexibility and, 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 and isn't that over, uh, over configuring or over configurization or things like that. And I think that is important. Uh, that's an important uh, point to take. But then you have to go back and say like, okay, is there good, are there good reasons or what are the good or the bad reasons for the, um, for the uh, way uh, things are um, designed that way? So, and then you learn something about both about um, the, your understanding of, of configuration and your technical understanding and the adequacy of the method and the requirements of this specific context. So that is an example also where this kind of like member's point of view adds, um, adds to the knowledge. So um, member's point of view, we talked al already about as, as the core thing in this, many of the qualitative uh, research, uh, but also spe uh, specifically on in the ethnography. Um, the other part is that in order to, to uh, as a, you're, you're interested in what normally takes place, you're not interested in how somebody performs for you. So it is a, the ordinary detail of life as it happens. And that is from a research from, from my colleague, Helen Sharp, uh, that we used here. Um, the, the, what I present now is based on a, a joint paper uh, in the transaction on software engineering in 2016 or 18. Um, so, and the example is what she looked into how Kanban boards are used or scrum boards are used in, um, or her interest was in, in communication and coordination in, in agile development. So he, she observed teams uh, working together and then also looking into how they use scrum boards and, and and story cuts on the scrum boards. And um, here's an example for, this is, this is the real world scrum board. This is a, a drawing of, of uh, cards there. And um, this is the part of the um, field work, uh, field notes that she, she took during this. And then of course you sample specimens. So you try to get uh, as rich as possible, um, both uh, the kind of, okay, of course you are embedded in that, but you try to, to both look, uh, have document what you see as rich as possible. That means it's both text, but it might be also, also collecting items. It might be taking photos. It might be referring to electronic um, sources and data as well. So you, 
not only it's not only you being there, but it's also taking this, uh, documenting what you see and how you see it, and even the the small details about how a card is moved around. But this is not only about understanding, but it's uh, not only about describing. It's also it takes an, an analytical stance on what what. Do I mean with that, or what do we mean with that? It's uh, you're you're not trying also to to describe like a a social practice as, as something like very strange happening. It might be very, very strange happening. Some of my uh, some of the 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 criticism of of this kind of research is why are we bothering with people obviously not doing not even implementing the textbook. Um, but we try to understand uh, why do people decide to or work that way in that specific context? What makes this a viable way of developing software or a viable way of designing uh, a software a configuration interface? So, um, and the point is here to instead of how could as a, from the start say how can we actually implement X or how can we use these tools or so to say how do software engineers manage to develop successful software? Um, what are their problems, conflicts, or successes? What do they count as as good re, good work or bad work? Um, why to uh, instead of saying like oh, they should use this tool. Uh, why do software engineers not use certain tools or features? So for example, in, this, um, in, the, in, the, in the case in the beginning where the um, software engineers did uh, use the social software to coordinate, um, they also used an issue tracker that was able to send out emails. So when we then in a meeting proposed that and said, well, kind of like, why don't you use the, the feature to send emails? They said, oh, we don't want to treat our colleagues that way. So there was an importance on, as there was a, uh, was a meaning of getting in contact and, and, and uh, uh, messaging each other um, because you didn't want to treat the other person as just a, a um, kind of a, a, a automaton or a robot or something like that. So, so they um, wanted to express, be able to express their appreciation for each other. They wanted to be able to say like, oh, good morning. Um, and yeah, kind of a nice work. Uh, let's, let's, let's continue that. And sometimes they, they also talked about football or, or things like that, or cricket in, was, in India was, is more, um, more prevalent. Um, so, so you're, it's not, so you're taking your judgment back, but you're asking also for the reasons for why things are in a certain way. So, and that also allows you then to say like, to, to understand um, what does compliant or non-compliant or innovative behavior tell us about the tools, methods and techniques that we think are more suitable. So here somehow we are, um, for the time of, of, for some time of the research, we are taking this stance and saying, as a, these people are, are uh, professionals. They are developing software successful for, for years. So what can their way of using or not using techniques and tools on methods tells us something about the methods and the tools as well. Um, and in order to be able to then communicate your findings um, to, to the audience, to the scientific audience, um, what you use in ethnography and in many of the qualitative research, you have thick descriptions. And that means that you um, have descriptions that allow the reader to judge your analysis. So when you read, for example, the article about uh, software product ecosystems, um, you will see that I'm citing um, a lot of the interviews um, in long passages. 
And that is not because I was too lazy to write uh, or something like that, but it's uh, to, to support the reader and you to judge and to maybe say like, mm, did she understand that interview really in, the, in a good way? Uh, and so, and that means that you need these thick descriptions for, for this academic accountability and to allow somebody else to then, for example, implement another case study and say like, okay, today we have these other, what you also said in your, in your, in the, the questions, today we have these other tools and um, we seem to have these problems seem to be solved or addressed, but these problems are still relevant. And in order to have new research being able to relate to that, you have these thick descriptions. Okay, but um, we, we then also looked into how people make use of ethnography in different um, research. And of course, in a way, what it allows is to, to understand better all these social and human and this cooperative and uh, aspects of software, enge software engineering. So um, how does a tool support distribution? How does a tool support collaboration between um, users and developers? Does a method support collaboration between users and developers? So you, you are kind of, you get some kind of ground truth about um, how do people cooperate? Um, you, inform, you can use that to inform the design of software engineering tools and, and also to improve methods and processes. And that's where the design research and the, and the action research comes in and that we talk about later. So I will not deepen in that, but also it helps to, to inform research programs in so far that you actually are able to um, complement, for example, research about um, the, uh, the design and development of, and again, there was a question in uh, earlier about um, um, machine learning systems. And so you can actually uh, um, kind of parallel to the technical research, how to design them, you can actually look into how to, how do people use them and, and how do people relate to machine learning systems in, in, in their day-to-day -day software engineering? Um, what we find, and that is uh, uh, that you, when, you, when you go into it and, and do a, a bit of ethnographic observation, you, there's five dimensions that are relevant and that change also how you, how you do and what you do in your research. And you need to discuss that ahead of time. And that is, um, participant versus whether how much your participation painting. Uh, many of, of us are software engineers, so you could actually do a program, but that means that you're, but often actually you, the, the researcher in software engineering would not participate in, the, in the, the programming of the software. So one of my PhD students worked with the hydraulic simulation. Um, the developers there were mathematicians uh, with a, often a PhD in in, in uh, applied math and they would not have a software engineering researcher uh, messing around with their differential equations. So, um, so there was definitely um, no, no participation in, in that. So in a participant observation, the researcher is acting as a member of the project and non-participatory observation that the researcher observes but does not participate. But then you often, when you're just observing, it's, it's a bit like um, if you're, as, as you, you might kind of come, come across strange. So sometimes it's important to find a, a role of what the um, ethnographers or social scientists call a legitimate peripheral participation. And that means, for example, in, in this case with, with the PhD students and the differential software um, solving differential equations, um, she was uh, documenting the architecture uh, or the evolving architecture for the, for the team. And that was a valuable uh, part because they wanted to use the architecture to support the people using the software to configure and customize the software. And so that was, um, that was, uh, 
her way of, of staying close to the, to the team. Next part is the duration of the field work. And of course, if you have a truly ethnographic study, you have long time, long term studies and long term engagement. In traditional um, ethnography, that can be months. Um, however, in software engineering, you have so there is studies. There are some studies uh, over where, where somebody over 15 months observed uh, development four days a week. Um, but they have also very short term studies uh, valid as well. So three days of study over uh, seven days of study over a three week period. Um, my experience is when you spend less than five days a week, um, maybe three days, that allows to start analyzing designing tools or preparing a workshop addressing the observed problems parallel to, to your observations. So um, so that is, that, but that is something to be decide, also decide ahead of time. Um, the space and location um, observation has to take place where the development takes place. And that is difficult in software because um, um, the, um, a lot of the software development takes place in the repository. So I think that is um, in software engineering, you um it it's always partly takes place online and it's often distributed and that means that you have to find ways of observing what goes on in that context um and that means that uh you might actually as when it when it's a distributed practice you might actually travel or if it is uh, purely like open source software development, you can, as you might actually participate in the development by observing it. Um, and often you combine observations with interviews and, and analyzing the, the repositories. You also can use uh, theoretical underpinnings, theories and social sciences to that, uh, to, to, um, to help you structure your analysis or also structure the gathering of data. Um, that there's a trade-off with that and um, you can read in the article about that further. Um, there's a, a theoretic underpinning will bring specific aspects of the field data into focus, but you need to read up on the theory. So there's, and social science theories are sometimes as, uh, as difficult as, as uh, formal theories. Um, the last dimension, uh, what is the intent in, in the ethnographic study? And I think that is important also in the communication with the developers. Um, we are there as engineers, so um, our en engineering researchers, that in many cases, uh, it is also about improving the software engineering practice and to explore new methods and tools. And that is also expected of us. So um, when I started to do empirical research in software engineering, the first question was, and yeah, and when can we discuss about how, how, how we can think, do things better? And uh, such intent interacts with an organization and it will affect the empirical, and, and that will affect the empirical work. Again, one of my first uh, projects uh, we actually cooperated around um, the development of, of, of flexible systems and user development in a telecommunication context. And they, um, they didn't want us to look in the beginning at all at their development process because they were afraid if we would be critical about it, they would have to change it and they didn't think that that would be good for the business. So it took us actually two, three years before the, the, the organization had enough trust into that we would not be uh, behave like the elephant in the porcelain store um, and allowed us to look in, in, into the to look into their processes. Um, so it is clear, it is important to be clear about your intent and to communicate it explicitly to the team and the organization. And here somehow it's both the team and the organization because um, I have 
problems in a way somehow if I if I um, if I uh, would kind of communicate to the management, for example, about ways of develop a behavior that management might consider problematic. So then suddenly you're um, you're harming the people you're doing the research with, and that is an, an ethical issue. Um, so the takeaways from that is uh, ethnography allows to understand software engineering from a software engineer's point of view. And it's about understanding, not only understand as well, seeing what's going on, but understanding the why of what is going on, the rationalities of practice, and to inform tool design and method development. As well, ethnography can then be used also to inform tool design and method development. And um, ethnographic studies can look very diverse and they can be tailored to the research interest and the context. So it is uh, something that you can actually work with. You don't have to uh, spend uh, three months in a, in a company in order to do an ethnographic study. So um, many of you might say like, okay, this is about understanding, but what about changing and what about making things better? And we are engineers here. And that is where the action and the design research comes in. So action research is, um, you're starting with an understanding of the context and the problems of in this context. And then based on that, you're taking part or initiating uh, action in the in this context, in the situation, and you observe what happens, and then start reflecting on the involvement, and come up with the findings and the publications and your thesis, and then kind of um, there might be new themes here. Um, and you can say that this has been also done earlier uh, in, a, in, a, in a more quantitative way when you look into Rick Basile's experience factory. Um, they proclaim that practice should be a laboratory. So they are collecting data about performance and initiating treatments and collecting data about the effects. So it was a very quantitative and a very kind of top down way of, of experimenting with methods in practice. Our process is more looking into taking the member's point of view from the ethnographic perspective or attitude with us um, in the designing the or kind of devising methods and improve possibilities as well, understanding the problem and and then also um, discussing the the uh, improvements and cooperating with practitioners around improvements and then implementing and evaluating whatever was decided together to, to, to in terms of change. And there are three or four uh, projects used, um, reflected in this article that I refer on, to on this slide. How can that look like? Um, again, the, the um, project together with the hydraulic simulation, um, there was the the, the student was a PhD student was um, spending time with the company uh, three days a week over extended time and um, after that there was this kind of deliberating change is discussing um, what what do we see could help the problems here and we looked into the introduction of architectural concepts. Um, supported kind of there was an ongoing architectural refactoring of the whole software so there was a, a, a kind of they kind of close as uh, used it continuously continued to to use the old product but they developed an, a, a new product with a new architecture parallel to that um and we we know uh Hata, Hata uh, participated in that um by documenting the architecture. And she looked into how to make a small, uh, small architecture level evolvability assessments part of the agile development that she was observing. And then um, 
that when that was decided, she was kind of part, part, uh, actively implementing new work practices. Uh, she did a prototype of, uh, of some of the, the architecture and she implemented uh, new methods and, and prototype new methods together with the, with the people involved and documented that, of course, and evaluated that. Um, so the, the thing here is that as with the ethnographic research, when you actually change things, the, the whole requirement on documentation of what you do and what the reaction of the project you're cooperating with is, and how does that work out? Um, how do, do practitioners uh, uh, find this was valuable? Uh, do they apply it themselves? Uh, what do they say about how that influences the, the change? And um, also how, they, how the change influenced their practice. And I think that is, that is, um, that is, as when you do this action research, you have to be very, very careful and you have to uh, document and try to triangulate observation with interviews and with um, looking at documents uh, in order to, to not get that your own kind of enthusiasm for the method that you develop take over. Okay, so design research, you can think about this is um, in a similar way where the action research focuses on the, uh, on the introduction of new methods and, and changes in the processes, changes in the way of working, design research uh, focuses on designing a method, a tool, a product. Um, and design research has, has uh, as the action research has been um, kind of quite a revolution in the in the social sciences. Um, the design research is something that came about with engineering becoming a scientific discipline. So um, engineering is is one of the big latecomers in the science in the science uh, community. Um, so, and that is in a way similar to understand that technology is about adapting material world in a purposeful way. So that means it's not physics. It's not only about understanding the material world. So Herbert Simon did a number of, of um, lectures on the, um, in the, at the MIT and started to think about what does that actually mean for then um, our understanding of, 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 of of research and it's the, 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 the book it is published in is, is called The Science of the Artificial. So, and there's these kind of points that he makes that we have to think goals and purposes as constitutive for the design and understanding of artifacts. So it's not only the physical behavior. And what implies, uh, that implies to relate uh, purpose, and goals and the characteristic character of the artifact and the environment in which the artifact performs. And I think here somehow you can think about software architecture when we look at, uh, when we discuss architecture, we don't only discuss the structure of the system, we discuss the structure, the character of, of our software, but we also discuss, does it serve the goals? And does it, is it, uh, is it, uh, functioning in the context it should be implemented. So we are looking into performance, we are looking into usability, we are looking into evolvability, and we are looking, also, so we have, have these kind of different qualities that we need software architecture to support. And uh, artifacts can be regarded as interfaces between the inner environment, the mechanics and of how they function and the outer environment, how they affect the world. And often this is about, not about kind of fulfilling the goals, but satisfying goals and means, uh, meaning kind of seeing what we want and seeing what we can. And the process and the product of the design interact. So that some of the points from his, his book. Um, and that means also theory and math play a different role. And I'm going a bit quicker through this because uh, we are also running late again. Um, so, and that has been similar thoughts have been brought about uh, on, on 
computer science and and your set money is is have uh, have is one of the Turing Award winners who who also reflected on this and said well um, well CS is an engineering discipline not building on physics and theory and design experiments are closer related than in physics so so the design is done in, as a, the, the design and the prototyping takes the role of an experiment and theory does not something is not something to be proven wrong, but to explain and guide design. So the role of theory in software design is, is different. And the how plays a more important role than the what, because um, normally the, the means that we use, the what we, we, we know, so, but it is about how we make that useful for implementing a specific functionality. And that means, but in a way somehow, when we have this kind of design focus in our research, then we also need to bring that into the methods. And that is where the design research discussion comes in. And it's this is one of the oldest uh, way of talking about design research to say like, and that is uh, Nanomaker and his co-authors co talk about information systems development as part of information systems research. And, um, I think it started in the IS community first because um, the social science as there, IS is, is kind of in the border between computer science and social science and there the social science is more um, um, kind of did start to discuss earlier about the design. Um, and so, and here somehow he started to say like, okay, we have to think about develop a conceptual framework and then develop some architecture structure design the uh, build a prototype but that kind of here you would be as a practitioner you would be happy with building a system right not only a prototype but the system but then for research in order to 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 then um, kind of say something that about uh, on a more generic general level you have to observe and evaluate the system um and here then of course what your research question is that will drive how the the prototype the implementation is designed in order to actually allow you to explore your research question um there's different ways here haven i that also from the information systems they focused very much on the the economic side of it and on the um the, the, the appropriateness um, of the um, of the solution from the context, uh, but you have here as, again somehow the, to to have the research as on the one hand kind of um, bringing in um, external um, criteria for the success or the, the 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 feasibility viability of the of the solution and on the other hand the, the knowledge base is from the from the uh, computer science nowadays as so there's there's more modern from human computer and interaction more modern uh, thinking about design research and to say like okay we sometimes the research the design process is part of the research so we have fast and fast, they talk about different ways of how design and research interact. And yeah, an example for that. So how can that be? And now we have gone to Gleitz and D'Souza and, and Helen Sharpa, both the co-authors of the ethnography paper. So um, Gleitz did research on configuration management. And so ethnography, so he did work with ethnographic observation of details of how people are seeking information and sharing uh, information about activities. Um, and the, this results in understanding of, of the rationale of what he observed and, and he called that impact management strategies. So uh, I'm developing this part of the software and I know that other parts of people use this software so I'm informing them about uh, changes that might affect them. And on the other hand, I am trying to get up to, uh, stay up to date with people developing the, the modules I depend on. So um, this, 
understanding is then validated through further research and interviews and and uh, does does the the concept resonate with the the, the members um, that leads to a design idea, idea and the idea is implemented and validated and there was a tool at Triadne, at Triadne and it is um, you see the the figure in the right hand side it's uh, validated uh, in a different project where it was uh, was used for for by by developers and here um, you have impact networks and you have uh, based on these networks you can then provide um, kind of automatic information automatically information and you can support uh, developers in um, uh, communicating their activities to relevant people so so that is uh, the kind of con connecting um, qualitative empirical research and observational strategies, and then also the implementing implementing as uh, so the development and and um, of methods and tools. Um, now, kind of you see, like all of this requires a deep involvement of the researcher in the field, and so it kind of isn't this all about individual cases and individual researchers and well trustworthiness and quality of qualitative research is uh, has been discussed um, heavily and these are the uh, Robson here kind of um, has a whole chapter on that uh, over chapter on trustworthiness on quantitative uh, or fixed design uh, strategies and on uh, flexible or qualitative uh, research strategies. And I'm going through this and through the ways of, of caring for um, uh, caring for for um, trustworthiness. Uh, validity in a way um, if you engage with a, with, a, with a context, you are changing this context. People will um, People might not actually, um, the example I gave from my first um, um, empirical project, uh, people were expecting us to be critical to their way of developing software. So it, as a result, they did not want to discuss that. And that is in a way somehow part of where the observation actually changes what it goes on there. And that is, of course, always um, an issue. You have the respondent bias, um, um, the developers uh, thinking uh, that you are interested in certain things and you have a certain opinion about things. And you have, of course, also your own biases because um, if, you, if you think a certain way of developing software is the right way, then you might, um, might find that, or you might kind of, this might actually uh, influence on how you, how you look into, into uh, what you see. And here somehow, this is, as there are ways to, to work with this, of course, then. Reliability, how do you handle your data and how do you make the data visible? And that needs to be explained and discussed in the method. Uh, generalizability, there's internal and there's external generalizability. So external generalizability, you normally discuss in, in quantitative research. So, and that is how, what do the data that we analyze here, how representative that is that of the, the whole as a, of, of the, the population that we are talking about? Um, can that be transferred to other, um, how sure can we be that our, um, our relation between data is is uh, is a representative of the population. Internal, um, we are never talk about external generalizability just based on one study, qualitative study. We are talking here about inner, internal generalizability. How sure are we that we saw all relevant aspects? So how sure are we that we know why certain um, certain uh, uh, decisions are taken in a certain way. Are we sure that we understand why 
we mainly have a walking architecture rather than a written architecture document. Um, and then of course, gradability is, is uh, kind of how, of course, when you can lie in the quantitative and in the qualitative research and both is stupid. Good. Um, how do we actually achieve that? So one of the thing is prolonged involvement. So you, you're just not going, it's not only about being there two hours. It's, it's about coming there again and making sure that you come so often that you um, don't find that you learn anything anymore. Um, and that is also the criteria for interview studies in, in a way that uh, uh, here. You look into triangulation, you look into data, observer, method, and theory triangulation. That means applying different theories can also be a kind of like, does another theory highlight other things? Um, combining observation and interviews, um, having somebody else, for example, your supervisor joining you sometimes, and so that uh, it is not only your observations and your impressions, but it's also somebody else's uh, more distant, more um, less involved um, and this, uh, observations that, that help you to understand what goes on. And then also um, using observations and interviews and uh, analyzing repositories. Peer debriefing, um, telling peers about that, that helps you to step back and keep a researcher's mindset and don't um, go native as the ethnographers say. Um, telling the practitioners, the software engineers, your findings and getting their feedback on that as in the design uh, research case by, by Kleitzen. Searching for a ne negative case, searching when you when you see kind of, okay, this is how things are normally built with, but are there things that are not built with that way? And why are they not built with that way? And so, so looking for a negative case is another way of, of, of countering your own bias in this situation. Out of trail, uh, documenting really everything that you do, all your field material, keeping, uh, keeping that together and um, providing the rich descriptions, we talked about that. Uh, with the triangulation, um, using qualitative methods to formulate hypotheses, so you can use also qualitative and quantitative methods together, and that is also something that is very, very strong. You can, for example, use qualitative methods to formulate hypotheses that then are subject to quantitative analysis. I've seen that a lot in software engineering research. But you can also use quantitative methods to understand the relevance of the qualitative findings. So how much of the software engineering takes place, uh, that, that, that takes place is of products and how much is uh, custom development, for example. And combining different methods on the same subject and, um, and that is what I talked about uh, triangulation already. So that is what I had here now, and but the the references. Wait, yeah, here's the references. So you will, you have them with the with the um, with the uh, um, with the the slides. Um, now we are at um, yeah. Yeah, we have passed the time for the uh, small group discussion. So maybe in order not to, to run too late, um, I propose that I just take questions from the, from the audience. So any questions? Um, 
maybe we should have done a short discussion in the groups and um okay so so now kind of if there is no question so uh there's two interpretations of that it could either be that i was too good with my lecture or that it was too far away from your own research and your own um your own your own kind of work or what you know so in order to for you to uh, maybe um ah, okay um yeah okay maybe could you discuss construct validity and internal validity okay here um construct validity uh would not um construct validity does not apply for qualitative research construct validity is whether the the things that i'm measuring is actually um how that does correspond does that correspond to what i would like to know so is my measurement construct in a good way connected to my research question um what can be an example in it um if you say if you talk about maintainability of source code and you evaluate uh, the size and uh, uh, as a, you have this code quality measurements about size of methods or cyclomatic uh, com um, cyclomatic complexity complexity and things like that do these measures actually tell something about maintainability or understandability so that is what is construct validity. Um, as we don't have measurements here, and we don't have a predefined research question, we don't have construct validity as an issue here. Um, internal validity, um, I need to, um, uh, similar here, what, what you want to have is an internal generalizability. So it's um, I would what you're interested in is to understand the speci this specific uh, context of software development, this open source project, this uh, group, this uh, product. Um, you want to be sure that you understand everything that is relevant for your research question in this context. Con uh, con in this specific context. So the, the criteria or the, the, the quality criteria are other quality criteria than quantitative research. And I think here Robson is, is very good in distinguishing um, instead of um, kind of evaluating, um, evaluating uh, our qualitative research according to, quant uh, to quality criteria of quantitative research, he is distinguishing and saying the, 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 the claim of qualitative research is a different one. And that means also the trustworthiness has to be established in a different way. Um, Ashkan, does that uh, address your, your question? Good. Um, what I recommend, and to take the small group discussion, okay, on qualitative uh, research, I that was a I, I left that the heading uh, the same. Um, I think you you could actually think about um, yeah, what are you what are you planning to do for your thesis and select one research topic that could include research on industrial practice and then discuss how you would design this research and think about um, 
both um, observational strategies and field strategies, uh, think about field strategies and think about how um, they can be combined with experiments and uh, with, with um, more quantitative evaluation things. Yeah. Okay, there was a question about um, looking into design research and action research, yes. Um, design and action is often close together, right? Uh, no kind of, maybe I should not kind of try to find one slide on this because there's no one slide that helps to answer that question. Um, there is, um, because sometimes, for example, if, if you introduce a new tool, then um, the, the tool is a design and the evaluation is a changing of practice. So you have often a kind of a tight connection and people talk in, uh, in, in human computer interaction, talk about um, action design research also. So, um, um, so what you um, so what you um, uh, so the, what I use for the distinction is if the focus of the research is on the characteristics of the designed artifact or the characteristics of the method, then I would frame this as a design research. But then often the evaluation is an evaluation that has some kind of action research elements in it. Whereas when I, uh, the, the main focus is on how a practice could be improved, then I would frame it as an action research and I would focus on the interventions that I design together with the practitioners and how they work out and how they relate them to to methods or tools. So I think it is sometimes a question of focus and action and design research are often very close together. Tiago, does that answer your question? I think you can also search for participatory action design research and get that. Yeah. And so I think I um, leave you for, for a, a break until the next uh, lecture starts. And um, I think here I have all articles listed that I used in the, uh, in the presentation. And um, so the article here by Sharp, Dietrich, and De Sousa, Helen, um, Gleitzen, and me on the role of ethnographic studies and empirical software engineering that is uh, show kind of, I think this is a quite a nice article summarizing and, and giving an overview and pointing to specific articles, uh, specific studies. And uh, when it comes to action research, this article, and it's of course by now published, um, this article is, is uh, the core reference. Okay. And here is an example for the design research. Good. Um, thank you everybody uh, for, uh, for listening. I hope that uh, you learned something new today and uh, enjoy the, the remaining of the week and the exciting research presented uh, to you by the other teachers as well. <laughs>